Good morning, and thank you for being here. There are some small signs that the nation as a whole is beginning to emerge from the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. But it is way too early to declare victory. Unemployment is still sky high, and the home foreclosure crisis is growing unabated. For the homeowner who is underwater, the economic crisis certainly is not over. When you are behind in your mortgage payments, when the bank starts calling you each and every day, when you lie awake at night wondering, how are you going to explain to your children that you must move? You can start to feel like you really are drowning. And too many people know that this feeling. Last year, 2.8 million households received a notice of foreclosure. Almost 4 million homeowners are late on their mortgage payments by 90 days or more as this discussion is moving forward. And the problem is predicted to get worse. As many as 2.4 million people could lose their homes by foreclosure by the end of this year. To its great credit, the Obama administration recognized early on that an important part of the nation's economic recovery is keeping as many people as possible in their homes. This makes sense from both an economic standpoint and a public policy standpoint. The Home Affordable Modification Program, known as HAMP, is a central piece of Treasury Treasury's effort to carry out that objective. But a year after the creation of HAMP, only 170,000 households have received permanent mortgages modifications. This appears to be extremely low. We continue to hear numerous reports of borrowers who want to participate in HAMP, but just don't know where to begin. If they do begin, they often encounter unresponsive lenders, repeated incidents of lost paperwork, phone calls not being returned, and a variety of other administrative frustrations. To make matters worse, there is evidence that some vulnerable homeowners, desperate to obtain help, are falling victims to foreclosure rescue scams. Instead of obtaining house, housing assistance for free through a legitimate housing counselor, these homeowners owners are being fleeced by scam artists posing as professionals. In addition, a new survey by the National Community Reinvestment Coalition provides evidence that minorities, particularly African Americans, may be less likely to receive a mortgage modification under HAMP and are more likely to be foreclosed on. This is just not acceptable. Moreover, this problem is compounded by the fact that HAMP still does not have a clear process by which a homeowner can appeal a denial of his or her application. These problems are reflected in the program's results as reported by Treasury and SIGTAR. The Mortgage Bankers Association says that HAMP and other government programs have made significant strides in stabilizing the housing finance, financing system and have assisted many people who otherwise would have lost their homes. But clearly we need to do a whole lot better. There can be legitimate debate over the numerical goals of the HAMP program. But the central issue we need to understand is why fewer than 200,000 homeowners have obtained so-called permanent modifications under the HAMP program and what we can do to increase the number. We cannot afford a lot of time to study the problem. We need to have a sense of urgency for those homeowners who are already behind in their mortgage payments the wolf is at the door already. Losing your house is a traumatic event.
for families, and it is a destabilizing event for our society. I think we have an obligation to extend a helping hand to responsible homeowners to help them get over the rough spots. And today I would like to hear ideas as to how we can best make the mortgage modification program work. On this point, I note that yesterday Bank of America announced that it was instituting a principal forgiveness solution for homeowners who are severely underwater. Bank of America should be congratulated for leading the way with this innovative proposal. We will be looking for ways to expand this approach and to include other banks. Again, I want to thank our witnesses for appearing today, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. And I will now yield to the ranking member from California, Congressman Darrell Issa, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This hearing is critical and timely. As you said, Mr. Chairman, and I join you, Bank of America making a decision to reduce the principal down to the value of the current value of the home is both in the homeowner's self-interest and their self-interest. As it was stated in the example uh, this morning, $250,000 home reduced to its current value of perhaps $200,000 and the mortgage reduced to that allows the homeowner at over five years to permanently shed that no longer value, but ultimately to remain in a home that would otherwise be sold to someone else for $200,000 or less. This is, this is a win-win if the homeowner can, in fact, make the ongoing payments at a reasonable uh, rate that is available in the market. It also allows people who were gimmicked or taken advantage of during the earlier time that find themselves in resetting loans, teaser loans, all the other examples we've heard, if they fit in this 49,000 uh, person uh, initial uh, pilot program, as Bank of America is call calling it, they will be converted to a conventional loan, one that has a long-term ability for the homeowner to plan and to pay. <clears throat> Additionally, I might note that this plan from Bank of America <clears throat> although not without pressure from other places, came without the assistance of the program we're speaking of today. It came perhaps out of frustration for the failures uh, covered by the SIGTARP in his independent audits of HAMP. Today, <clears throat> as we look at HAMP, we look at a promise of the President, a commitment by the President, a, a commitment broadly by the Congress in both parties that is not being kept. Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent that the, uh, uh, the poster, which was actually put up by the, uh, the special IG, be up for the entire hearing because it is, first of all, factual, and second of all, I'm sure that all members will be referring to it. Without objection. <clears throat> the projection of providing relief, not application, not promise, not hope, but relief for three to four million homeowners has neared a 96 percent failure. In one year's time, as the chairman said, approximately 170,000 homeowners have qualified for permanent loan modifications. Many of those have already redefaulted. But that's not the story that is most concerning to those of us at the dais and particularly to this member. What's concerning is the 1.3 million people who have applied and held out hope that they were going to get a modification. 1.1 remain today. Doing my arithmetic, 170,000 were put into permanent modification, 30,000 were basically told that they probably were never good candidates and after months of waiting find themselves without a loan and without hope. But beyond that, people have waited three, five, six, not now as long as nine months with an open end to get an answer. That has simply caused the, the volume to swell of people who are making uh, payments in hopes that it will lead to a solution when in fact it appears as though a great many of them should be looking for more affordable alternate housing, should be planning for that, and should be uh, given the opportunity to, uh, to make those plans with certainty. Mr. Chairman, both you and I have had home loans over the years and we would be outraged if our application 
with our income and other information were not accepted within days of our contacting a loan officer. More importantly, we would be outraged if, if we were not answered within days or weeks as to whether or not, at least preliminarily, we qualify. Most of us have had pre-qualifications from banks and other lending institutions. Banks and lending institutions without government assistance or interference normally can do this in a short period of time. Clearly, this program has done just the opposite. It's created huge periods of uncertainty, perhaps well-intended. We need to make a change. Uh, if I could uh, roll this video very quickly of the President so we're all reminded of the promise and what the charge is for all of us under uh, the HAMP program. Under this plan, lenders who participate will be required to reduce those payments to no more than 31 percent of a borrower's income. And this will enable as many as three to four million homeowners to modify the terms of their mortgages to avoid the, uh, foreclosure. To prevent foreclosures for as many as four million homeowners and lower interest rates and lift home values for millions more, we are implementing a plan to allow lenders to work with borrowers to refinance or restructure their mortgages. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the opinion of, of this ranking member that this is a mandate of our president. It is a program that whether you voted for the TARP or not must be made to work and must be made to work dramatically better than it currently is. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity of an opening statement. Yield back. I'd like to thank the gentleman ranking member for his statement. Uh, I would like to yield three minutes to the gentleman from Baltimore, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm very glad that you uh, called this hearing. And I'm looking forward to, to hearing from today's witnesses, and not only because it is an issue the issue of foreclosure is an issue that affects every one of our districts, but also because we have an impressive group of witnesses before us, each of whom could occupy a hearing unto themselves. I particularly want to thank John Taylor, President and CEO of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, NCRC. It's not only bringing dedicated and passionate people together to ensure that public policy functions for the public but also boasts an extremely talented group of uh, policy professionals who provide this Congress with invaluable assistance. I was privileged to briefly address NCRC's annual conference earlier this month, and as always, I came away inspired by their dedication to a cause greater than themselves. President Obama arrived at the White House last January facing an economic climate unlike that inherited by almost any other president before him. As a response, his administration has aggressively worked to not only stabilize the financial markets, but also to ensure that recovery is not limited to Wall Street and reaches all of our communities. The Home Affordable Modification Program was designed to make mortgage payments reasonable for homeowners who were caught in the economic downturn. However, a confluence of factors has re rendered the program far less effective than we or President Obama uh, would have imagined or hoped. Unemployment, a punctured home price bubble, and a restricted access to credit only exacerbated certain flaws in the HAMP process. Today's hearing will reveal hard truths about the design and the execution of HAMP. For that reason, this hearing is critical, Mr. Chairman, and is a critical component in our role of ensuring that government operations function with the highest level of effectiveness and efficiency. We must set aside our preconceived notions about these policies, good or bad, and conduct an honest evaluation of whether this program is accomplishing as much uh, is absolutely, as is absolutely required to get our constituents through this difficult storm. I have often said, Mr. Chairman, that we are the greatest country in the world. This is the greatest country in the world. And we will get through this storm. The question is not whether we will get through the storm. The question is who will be living in your house after the storm is over? Who will have your job after the storm is over? Will you still have your health care and your health? And will your children be able to go to college, will have gone to college after the storm is over? That's the question. And so I thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. And with that, I yield back. I now yield three minutes to the, thank you, gentlemen, for a statement. I now yield three minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Who's Chairman. Who's the ranking member of the subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding today's hearing. As you know, the Domestic Policy Subcommittee has held three hearings on the foreclosure problem, and I appreciate the full committee's attention. 
to this important issue. Despite the commitment of $75 billion of taxpayer money, the American people continue to suffer from the rising tide of foreclosures, which hit an all-time high last month. The ranking member and I have continued to point out the failure of Treasury Department's technocratic tinkering to alleviate this problem and the administration's efforts to disguise the failure of their programs from the public. Despite this unprecedented commitment of taxpayer resources, a reoccurring, a reoccurring theme in this administration, the problem of foreclosures has not been solved, and in many ways it's worse than ever. The ranking member and I have pointed out Treasury's efforts to move the goalposts in an attempt to avoid accountability for its failure by redefining success. First, Treasury told us that their goal was three to four million mortgage modifications. In fact, we just heard the President say that himself. That would, quote, help keep Americans in their homes in a way that is, quote, sustainable over the long term. Then at last month's Treasury, then last month, a Treasury fishery told the committee that the administration's goal was actually mere offers of temporary mortgage modifications. An offer of temporary modification doesn't provide anybody sustainable help, and it is actually hurting many homeowners by giving them false hope and encouraging them to devote hard-earned resources to mortgages that will ultimately end up defaulting anyway. As I've argued before, Mr. Chairman, delaying foreclosure does not help the many Americans who are fighting to keep their jobs or find new ones. Delayed foreclosures only serve to prolong their economic hardship, drain them of much-needed resources, and defraud them of opportunities to find more affordable housing options. The Obama administration is once again failing to live up to its promises of transparency and accountability. In light of this issue, I was especially interested to read the recent audit of HAMP released by the Independent Special Inspector General for TARP, which confirmed many of our previous findings about the Treasury Department's actions. If the Bush administration and the Democratic Congress did anything right in the bailouts of 2008, it was establishing the office of the SIGTARP and putting Mr. Borofsky in place as an independent watchdog over these programs. I applaud his efforts and his staff's efforts for once again courageously exposing the waste of taxpayer resources and the lack of transparency in the Treasury Department. As the SIGTARP explains in his audit, the foreclosure problem facing the country today is reflective of the larger economic and employment problems facing the American people. Without a job, it is almost impossible for any American to afford any mortgage payment. The American people deserve jobs and an economic recovery, which this administration continues to deny them through anti-growth, big government, intervention, interventionist economic policies. The only viable long-term solution is to keep more Americans in their homes and in their jobs, for that matter, is a broad-based economic recovery built on the foundation of free markets, fiscal responsibility, and limit go limited government that has made our nation strong and prosperous for more than 200 years. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing, and I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses. I yield to the gentleman yep. from uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we previously uh, discussed, I have a letter here respectfully requesting that this committee do as it has done in the past and thoroughly investigate a form of voter intimidation, the attacks and threats against members of Congress that have been occurring since the vote on the health care debate. Right. Well, uh, first of all, let me thank the gentleman for his, um, uh, his interest in that. And of course, I must say that I have an interest in it, too, because I think that threats coming from any place is something that um, we need to uh, make certain that we do everything we can to prevent it. And this committee actually is the committee that really would have the jurisdiction over that. So um, um, I'm not sure in terms of uh, how we would frame it, but I'm interested in it. And I will ask staff to look into it and see in terms of you know, what we would do, because it's such a broad area. That, um, But uh, here again, I want you to know that I am interested in it, and uh, we will talk further as to how we might be able to pursue it. Thank you for your interest. Thank you again for your bipartisan support, yeah. Mr. Chairman. We will now turn to our first panel of witnesses. It is a long-standing policy that all witnesses are sworn in. So if you please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, if so, answer in the affirmative? Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Let me just say before we get started, and before I introduce our, our witnesses, let me just, um, this is a very serious situation. People are losing their life's earnings in their homes. They've paid on it, they've put their money in, and now all of a sudden they're being asked to leave because of the fact that they are having difficulty making payments. 
You know, we have here an example of the problems that people are encountering. Where are those box of keys? Who, where are they? I just want to show them, you know, in terms of to let you know how serious this matter is and how many lives are being affected by it. You know, I have this whole big thing of keys here that I just wanted to show you, but we'll, 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 we'll move back and, 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 and do that a little later. Uh, it's coming in now? Yeah. These are keys of people, in many instances, that live in their house. Now the house is being foreclosed, and these keys have been collected. This is a disgrace. I mean, we are a better country than this. We can do better than this. So we are having this hearing today to see what we can do to turn this around. Uh, this is just too much to take. The families are being destroyed. Children are have being moved from place to place because of the fact the mortgage is not being paid. And a lot of them, if they could get modifications, they would be able to work it out. And they just need a little support, I need a little help, or we would be where the gentleman from Maryland indicated, you know, um, they'll be out of the houses, somebody else will be in them, but the houses, you know, will be filled. You know, and that's the sad part, and people who've given so much of their lives, you know, and then now being asked or being thrown out. Thank you very much. I just wanted to show that. The Honorable Neil Borowski is here today, is a Special Inspector General for the Trouble Asset Relief Program. As the Principal Overseer of the TARP, Mr. Borowski is responsible for conducting audits and investigations related to the hundreds of billions of dollars flowing through Treasury to rescue our troubled economy. Including in those dollars is the funding of HAMP. Today, Mr. Borowski will present findings and recommendations based on his audit of HAMP. We welcome you, Mr. Borowski. The Honorable Jean Dodaro is the Acting Controller General of the United States and the Head of the Government Accountability Office, GAO, is conducting an ongoing review of HAMP. Today, Mr. Dodaro will present an update on the activities of HAMP to, to date, as well as the preliminary findings of GAO's current evaluation of loan services, implementation of that program. Welcome, Mr. Dodaro. We have also with us uh, Mr. John Taylor. Mr. Taylor is the President and CEO of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. Today, Mr. Taylor will present the findings of NCRC's investigation of foreclosure rescue scams, as well as the result of a survey of distressed borrowers seeking assistance from HEMP. Welcome, Mr. Taylor, for being here. And of course, we also have with us Mr. Calabria, is the Director of Financial Regulation Studies at the Cato Institute. We are delighted to have all of you here. So why don't we start with you, Mr. Borowski, and then we would just come right down the line. Thank you, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, members of the committee. It's a privilege to appear once again before you to testify and to present our most recent audit on the HAMP program. I'd like to, to thank this committee for its support of our office and the leadership and tenacity that you have shown in bringing transparency and accountability to the HAMP program. The program was announced more than a year ago, and as Treasury has acknowledged, the results have been disappointing with fewer than 200,000 mortgages being permanently modified. In order to the, assess the success of a program, however, one must start with any government program with what it set out to do, what were its goals, what was it meant to, who was it meant to help. Unfortunately, with respect to the HAMP program, even this preliminary step has been a challenge. When the program was first announced, Treasury described it as a program designed to help three to four million homeowners by modifying their mortgages to a sustainable level so they could stay in their homes. If this was the goal, absent some unexpected or unanticipated change in circumstances, it will not be met. As a Treasury official acknowledged to us, it's estimated that half of that amount will occur, one and a half to two million permanent modifications. Now, Treasury has consistently told us throughout this audit, and it's borne out by 
uh, statements the Treasury made back last year in March that its goal wasn't for permanent modifications, three to four million. It was to make three to four million offers for temporary or trial modifications. And it may well be that the program is on pace to meet that goal. However, as we detail in our audit report, we believe that this goal is essentially meaningless. This program's success will be defined and must be defined as it was justified to the American people. How many people who will receive permanent modifications and get to stay in their homes as a result of this program? And it is unclear at this point what that number may be. One thing that is certain, it will be extremely difficult or impossible until Treasury puts out its number of what its estimate is and what its goal is for permanent modifications for it to be able to honestly and accurately assess the success of the program and far more importantly for today's purposes to make the necessary changes so they can meet those goals. We believe that it is unacceptable that one year into this program Treasury has still failed to identify what its goal is for the number of permanent modifications to actually help people stay in their homes. There have been some successes. Treasury has signed up more than 110 servicers, getting 90 percent coverage, and has built an infrastructure for this program. But as we detail in this audit, the disappointing numbers are the result of some mistakes. It's been plagued by certain errors. Servicers have complained to us about the, the constant changes in, in program guidance from Treasury, um, documentation requirements, even to the, the net present value test, which is the computer model that, tre that Treasury prepared that was intended so that the servicers um, can know whether or not a mortgage is, um, is, is, uh, is appropriate for it to be modified or not. These types of changes have, have, have contributed to problems with the program. Similarly, we've noted um, problems with the result of Treasury pushing and at times pressuring servicers to do verbal trial modifications. That is putting mortgages temporarily into the program based only on the word, the verbal statements of a borrower without getting verified income, verified documentation of income. Um, this problem has led to, um, it's been, we found it to be essentially counterproductive. It's led to a huge backlog of trial modifications. Importantly, just diverted scarce resources that could otherwise be devoted to permanently converting modifications. And, and perhaps worst of all, it may have actually harmed the people this program was intended to help borrowers who were put into hopeless modifications with no chance to succeed. We've also learned about dangers about redefault, and that is when borrowers who get permanent modifications but are unable to continue because either the, per the payments that they have are still unaffordable or because they're too hopelessly underwater to be able to continue or decide not to continue to make payments. We recommended to Treasury to reassess the vulnerability to redefault, lest billions of taxpayer dollars be lost um, supporting mortgage modifications that will be doomed to failure. Regrettably, Treasury has not adopted this recommendation. On a final note, Mr. Chairman, I just to address your point about mortgage modification fraud, uh, it is a, a significant and widespread problem. SIGTARP alone, we have two dozen invest criminal investigations ongoing into, the, into these frauds. And I, I am pleased to announce that we've had a recent success. Uh, last summer, we worked with the FTC to shut down one of these frauds. Um, and this week, I'm very pleased to announce that two of the principals of that fraud, uh, Glenn Rosofsky and Michael Trapp, um, SIGTARP agents working with our partners at IRS, secured criminal charges that were filed against them in California. Um, that will hold them accountable for the more than $1 million fraud that they executed. Um, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Ice, and members of the committee, thank you for hearing my testimony today, and I do look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Borowski. Mr. Dodero. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Issa, members of the committee. I'm very pleased to be here today to discuss GAO's work regarding the Home Affordable Modification Program. Uh, as been pointed out this morning, we issued a report uh, last uh, July looking at the program. Right now, there's been a lot more trial modifications uh, put in place than permit modifications that's been pointed out so far. 1.1 trial modification, million uh, uh, trial modifications were put in place. 800,000 of those are still active, and less than 200,000 uh, have been achieved uh, permanent modification. But it's also important to look at the trends. If I might direct your attention to our chart uh, over here, the top line is the trial modifications that have been started. And as you can see, uh, they peaked around last September, October timeframe, and since then have been declining. 
the line, the dotted line at the bottom, are the beginnings of the permanent modifications that have, were started and then converted into the 170,000 that were in place at the end of February. Now, the challenge going forward uh, is to take the pipeline of the trial modifications and, and have decisions made on them, whether they're to be converted to permanent modifications or, uh, or not. Uh, but also, importantly, uh, the pipeline for trial modifications has to be replenished for these uh, first uh, lien uh, holder uh, uh, mortgages in order to make sure uh, that the goals of the program ultimately are achieved. In addition to the first lien program, Treasury needs to uh, establish and move forward on the second lien holder program. There's a foreclosure uh, alternative program that's waiting in the wings to be started as well. And there's the hardest hit housing fund, which is directed in, in five states in particular. So you have other programs that have not yet uh, been implemented that are necessary to be able to do this, as well as dealing with this first lien holder modification program. Now, like a lot of other aspects of the Troubled Asset Relief Program, uh, the GAO, uh, along with the IG from SIGTARP, have been making a number of recommendations to increase the transparency and accountability of the program. Treasury has taken some steps to address our recommendations last July, but has yet to fully implement many of them. First, uh, we had recommended that they establish performance metrics and, and benchmarks, which would include uh, the numbers uh, target for permanent modifications as well. They also had not yet resolved uh, compliance issues associated with remedial actions or penalties for servicers that were not uh, complying with the program. We also suggested they regularly update the number of people who could be helped through this program because of evolving economic uh, and other uh, circumstances. Uh, we've continued our work and we've noted uh, preliminarily some indications of inconsistencies about how these borrowers are being treated, when borrowers are communicated with, how early in the process of the, uh, the lateness on their payments. Some are being contacted after 30 days being delinquent, others not until 60 days. So there's inconsistencies in terms of the criteria that are put forth. There's also uh, problems with how complaints uh, are being dealt with. Uh, there's no uh, set process uh, for that yet in place. Also, we had recommended that Treasury follow up to determine whether or not the counseling requirements that were required for certain borrowers were, were uh, complied with, and they've not yet done that. I think we're missing a huge opportunity here for more consumer education and financial literacy and consumer protections, uh, but we won't know whether that's complied with or not going forward unless Treasury implements our recommendation. Uh, we're also looking at what kind of appeal process would make sense for this program to provide due process protections uh, for borrowers. Uh, I just want to assure this committee that we take this issue very seriously. The TAR program has helped a number of institutions. It needs to have similar help offered to households uh, to afford them the protections going forward. We will continue uh, our work looking at whether or not this program is achieving its objectives, whether or not it's being managed effectively uh, and carried out properly and prudently in the best interest of the American citizens. So I thank you for your time this morning. I'd be happy to answer questions at the appropriate time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Dr. Calabria. Uh, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, uh, distinguished members of the committee, I do want to thank you for the invitation to appear at today's uh, important hearing. Before I begin my testimony, I do want to emphasize a point that Chairman made about foreclosure scams, and uh, these are widespread, and I think we want to should all commend the work that SIGTARP is doing. Uh, I would as well encourage the committee to bring the Federal Trade Commission up to update you on their efforts, and they really are the ones leading the effort against foreclosure scams. Uh, my testimony is going to touch on essentially two points. Uh, the first point, in question rather, is why have the current administration and the previous administration efforts, along with those of the mortgage industry, to reduce foreclosures had so little impact on the foreclosure numbers? I very much want to emphasize at this point, it's not a partisan issue. If you look at HOPE now and you look at HAMP, they are very different programs, but the assumptions underlying their structure are the same. Uh, the second question is, 
given what we know, why those efforts haven't worked, what are our options going forward to improve those? So starting with, I will give a very short answer to why I think the previous efforts have not worked, and that's because the implicit assumption behind these programs that most of, if not all, of the foreclosures are a result of predatory lending or exploding arms is simply false. The simple truth is that the vast majority of mortgage defaults are being driven by the same factors that have always driven mortgage defaults, generally a negative equity position on the part of the homeowner coupled with a life event, generally most often a job loss uh, or reduction of earnings in some other point. So I would emphasize until both of these components, negative equity, negative income shock are addressed, I think foreclosures will remain at very high levels. Uh, I would note if payment shock alone were the dominant driver of defaults, then we would observe most defaults occurring around the time of reset on the interest rate, but we do not see that. What we see is the vast majority of defaults occurring long before reset. Uh, Obviously, the high level of foreclosures, I think, has left us all frustrated. Uh, I think we need to start with asking ourselves that these answers need to be grounded in solid, unbiased analysis. And I would want to reiterate and, and emphasize some of the points that Neil made, which is to gauge the success of this program, we need to have a reasonable baseline. I don't believe we have any really baseline to establish whether the Treasury is doing a good or bad job, really. Uh, and I think if you look at the promises that the Treasury has made, it's really kind of hard to conclude that they're either just making the numbers up or they don't have a sense of what their own metrics are. So the important part of this is Treasury needs to put out metrics upon which we can measure their performance and know whether they're doing, they're doing a good or bad job. Uh, I think it's also essential that Treasury put out a credible, clear analysis of the cost and benefits of this program. Uh, if the full $75 billion is spent, and if we end up, which I expect that maybe we will have, if we're on the track to have maybe permanent modifications of about 200000 if we're lucky, then that assistance will mean that we will have spent almost $400,000 per permanent modification, which is, I will note, more than twice the median U.S. home value. So we do need to make sure that this money is going and being spent effectively. Uh, before discussing specific proposals, I think we need to start from the very clear, uh, very clear reality that almost half, about 50 percent of foreclosures foreclosures today are driven by job loss. Absolutely no way we can address the foreclosure situation without addressing the job situation. So I would say the most significant thing we could do is try to find a way to foster an environment that is conducive to private sector job creation and the foreclosure problem will follow that. Um, in addition, I think we need to focus not simply on homeowners in foreclosure, but those who are potentially at risk of foreclosure. For instance, I will note that about four million of the jobs that have been lost in this recession have been in what are called mass layoffs. Uh, mass layoffs present a double shock to our household. Not only do you have the loss of your home, but you also take a loss to the housing market because of a very uh, big shock to the labor market. But as damaging as mass layoffs can be, they have one advantage, which is the Department of Labor collects statistics on them and reports them because there are laws that require that em employees receive notice. But so there's a point in intervention where we can try to help families before they actually hit foreclosure because we know that these mass layoffs are coming. But despite that connection, there's almost no coordination between HUD and Department of Labor. So I would encourage HUD and I would encourage Department of Labor to partner so that the appropriated dollars we have spent so far in counseling funds can be focused on those workers at the time they receive a notice of a layoff. Because we know they're going to put there's a high probability that six, nine months later after their layoff is when they're going to be getting the financial trouble. Uh, I would also emphasize, you know, we do need to approach this as a form of triage, which in my mind, we need to put our resources at those families who need it the most. Uh, several of the programs, such as those that are aimed not at families in foreclosure, but simply those who cannot refinance because they're underwater, I think should be ended. These divert resources away from the families who are most in need and focused on families who don't need it. Uh, so in including, I want to focus, emphasize very, very strongly, we need to do something about the underlying causes, and the underlying causes are not arms. They are, they are in the employment market, they are negative equity, and that needs to be the focus of this. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Calabria. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Uh, good morning, Chairman Towns, Ranking Mer Member Izzer, and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, my name is John Taylor. I'm President of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. I come to you from the front lines of America's foreclosure crisis to tell you that the battle is being lost. Our economy will continue to be dragged down by these mounting foreclosures if immediate change is not instituted. The Federal Government's response to the foreclosure crisis called Making Home Affordable comes in two forms. HAMP, the Home, Ownership, uh, Home Affordable Modification Program, 
and HARP, the Home Affordable Refinance Program. The federal government's response, HAMP and HARP, while an improvement over the previous administration, is simply failing to make a difference. The goal of HAMP and HARP was to help nearly 5 million families facing foreclosure. How many have they helped to date? HAMP has modified a total of 170,000 permanent loans. HARP has refinanced a total of 190,000 permanent loans. So a total of all the 5 million plus uh, uh, folks facing foreclosure, the government in the total length of this program has done 360,000 uh, permanent uh, modifications and refinances. Now consider that just last month we had over 300,000 foreclosure filings alone. In 2009, for the year, we had 2.8 million foreclosure filings uh, alone for that year. So when you consider a number like 360,000 being modified or refinanced, you can understand why we're saying it's a failure. Two important points here, too. According to Inspector General, uh, Special Inspector General Borofsky, the Treasury Department under its current plans will expend only $22 billion of the $75 billion committed to the HAMP program. Why they're sitting on this funds is beyond belief. As for HARP, 99% of the refinancing of this program does it to borrowers with LTVs of less than 105%, meaning they're really not helping people who are below water, they're helping people who are floating on the water. Now, the keys to the crisis that Chairman Towns pointed to, I just want to point out to the members of the committee, these keys represent a home, an individual home. Every single key in this box represents a family that's losing their home, these keys are just what will happen while we have this hearing. These keys represent 1,635 families across America who will lose their homes just while we sit here talking about what needs to be done. And let me show you what Fannie and Freddie, sorry, what the federal government is going to do through the HAMP program during the same period of time. These are the amount of homes, these are the amount of homes they're going to help out of this lot. That's, that's the entire HAMP, during this program, all these houses, during this hearing, all these houses are going to be lost. This is what the HAMP program is going to help. Well, let's give the government some more credit. What are they going to do with the HOP? Those are the refinancing. Your friends at Fannie and Freddie. Here's what they're going to do in that same period of time for the same, that same group of people. Now, if you think that this is success, then, you know, continue the way things are. But I can tell you this. Regardless of how you, how you view this, we spend trillions for Wall Street. This is a trickle for Main Street. And whether you, you think, whether you look at this crisis and say, well, you know, and I know some members of Congress are fond of saying, you know, some of the homeowners bit off more than they can chew. And others will say, well, you know, there are a lot of greedy people, uh, lenders, brokers looking for a fee, a quick fee. Let's be clear about two things. First. The subprime lending became the norm for the mortgage industry, uh, and, and that's the kind of loan that was made to, to anybody who, uh, the, 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 the subprime lending became the norm for the mortgage industry. Banks would, banks would not have made these loans seven or eight years ago. They simply would not be the norm. Subprime was not the norm. It was an, it, it was an exception to what this industry did. This became the norm. Then this Congress in 1994 told the Federal Reserve to fix this said, you issue unfair and deceptive rules and practices that prohibit the kind of activities that are going to land people in this, including people who are biting off more they, than they can chew. In the old days, the bank would have said, you can't afford this. But because you can get a fee, you can get money, quick money, because it's being guaranteed by Wall Street or by your securitizer, that this is what happened. This industry ran amok, and the Federal Reserve did not respond to this crisis until July of 2008, when it finally Long after the horse had escaped, the, bond, the, bond, the hay had rotted, the bond roof fell in. Long after that, they finally issued rules on unfair and deceptive practices that would have prevented this kind of system. Second, for those who think, well, you know, buyer beware, I got mine, good luck to those folks. Let me just say this. Everybody has a dog in this hunt. When it comes to these foreclosures, every foreclosure reduces the value of their neighbor's property. Millions of foreclosures cause job loss, reduction in tax, tax revenue, and dragging down the, the American co economy. Foreclosures reduce all homeowners' equity and, for many, a significant portion of their retirement savings. Over $7 trillion of wealth has been lost by American households. 
So let me, I, I, I'm out of time, Mr. Chair, so I can, if I can stop now. I can talk a little about the studies. I wanted to make a couple of recommendations. It's obviously the committee's call. Would you have an opportunity to do so in the question and answer period, I'm certain. Okay. okay. Thank yes. you very much for your yes. testimony. Uh, let me begin, I guess, um, Mr. Borowski and Mr. Dodaro. What do you really see here as the problem? You know, uh, the fact that we've only been able to do less than 200,000 modifications. I mean, what is the problem? And there's $75 billion, I think, has been allocated. 50 and then 25, yeah, I think it was 75, yeah. So what is the problem? I mean, people are losing, the, and when I look at the keys and know, in fact, that they represent people. They represent folks who poured their hearts into their homes, saved, and then all of a sudden now they are asked to leave because they miss payments on their home. They're good people, people that want to do right. What do you think that needs to be done that's not being done? Mr. Chairman, what we found in our audit is that I think a, lot, a part of it is that doing a program like this, is, it's very retail-oriented. It's on an individual basis. And when Treasury set this up, they, they outsourced that to the, the mortgage servicers. One of the problems that we've heard, and I know that uh, in reviewing Mr. Dara's testimony that they've seen as well, is this lack of, of planning up front. Uh, almost a, a ready, fire, aim type of approach where these constant changes in guidance and documentation and requirements, and, and yesterday another guidance change came down, and it's an admirable change. It's, it's good for the program, but it's going to require these servicers to once again reset their systems, reset their, their procedures, and if there had been, perhaps if there had been more planning up front, these servicers wouldn't have been constantly having to react to these changes in circumstances and the emphasis on verbal modifications. So what happened is the infrastructure was not quite in place and then it got overwhelmed by constant changes and, and lack of adequate planning up front that has created this, this, these tremendous backlogs and inefficiencies. We've all heard reports about servicers who lose uh, borrowers' um, paperwork. They send the paperwork in and then the paperwork is gone and we, we read about how you know, you could see seven or eight times borrowers send in the paperwork. And one of the servicers explained to us that they did, in fact, lose paperwork because they were so overwhelmed because of the verbal modifications, because of the constant changes of their systems, that they hired a vendor and the vendor lost all the documents. That's not in any way to remove responsibility from the servicers. That just wasn't the focus of our report. But I think one of the contributions to why this has been so slow to get off the ground and why it's been so inefficient is this sort of lack of planning. I would uh, add a couple points. First, I would underscore the fact that there's been a number of program changes. So the program hasn't been stable. For example, last summer, Treasury initially uh, mentioned that the, it would be okay to approve trial modifications based upon stated income as opposed to having documentation and verification of the income of the borrowers. Then subsequently, they changed that guidance and now uh, before trial modifications, you need to have, you know, substantiated documentation. The other uh, point and the recommendation we made last July uh, was that you needed program metrics. There's no standard guidance about when the servicers have to contact the borrowers, whether it's 30 days after they're delinquent or 60 days. You need some standards. How quickly should they respond to telephone calls? How quickly should they process the information? All these uh, issues in terms of how the process should proceed. How do they handle complaints? How do they do it? None of these things are yet standardized that where you could hold the servicers accountable. And as I mentioned, we made a recommendation last July that they have some ability to invoke penalties for servicers that don't comply with the requirements, but they need to be established first. Uh, secondly, uh, they're having difficulty in a number of cases from the servicers we talk with of getting income verification from the borrowers, and that's taking uh, some additional time. Now, they've, uh, you know, forestalled making decisions on some of the trial modifications. Uh, the other issue is that these other programs, which are intended to deal with some of the negative uh, equity issues, like the hardest hit pro uh, fund, hasn't been started yet. The second lien holder program hasn't been started yet. So 
There were some problems with stability in the first program out of the chute for the first lien ho homeowner one, and these other programs haven't been brought online yet, even though it's been a year uh, into the program. So with those activities, you, we think you'll see a better outcome, uh, but they need to be managed properly. Quickly, so you don't think it's a lack of money? I, I think there's plenty of money. I mean, of the 36 point uh, seven billion that they've committed to the HAMP program, 58 million has been spent as of the end of February. So there's plenty of money. It's, it's, it's not a question of lack of, of funding. It's a question of making sure you have the commitment of the servicers. Uh, the Treasury has enough people to ac accurately manage the program and that there's process and, and means to hold people accountable for moving forward and they're not there yet. Right. Time has expired. I yield five minutes to the gentleman from California, Ranking Member Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to begin, I'm going to share just one example of the many I've received. <clears throat> this one comes from a Mr. Paul Habib who was involved in a trial loan modification. He has submitted and received approval first verbally and then canceled based on a rule change then in writing and canceled based on some rule and change he's now being asked have after they have lost his applications twice to fill out yet a third one now he happens to be a wamu chase uh applicant but Certainly we're going to hear more today about the problems of Countrywide since it's a defunct company that uh, B of A is trying to uh, act on behalf of after their acquisition. Let me try to be a businessman for a moment, uh, 10 years removed, but, but I still let's get to the core of what Mr. Borowski and uh, uh, Mr. Didera, what, what you've seen that doesn't work, I've read your reports, they're very good. But they tell us that this system that we're presently using is not going to work any better in spite of that curve under the current situation. 1.3 million people were given hope, 170,000 were given loans. Uh, the delta between the hope and the loan is so great as to be a misery inflicted by the government in their own program. I think we can all agree that, that that's not acceptable. So let me just run through, and, and others uh, uh, that have familiarity with this can weigh in. As I said in my opening statement, if, if I went out to buy a home today, I would go for pre-approval. It would take a matter of days or weeks. I would then have an amount of money based on documentation that I would qualify for. I would look at a home that I wanted to buy. Let's just assume it's my own home and it's in foreclosure. And I would have it appraised independently and they would come up with an appraisal within days. None of that has changed from the boom era to today. Why in the world are we not discussing a change that says, look, anyone can pre-approve you for a loan. Anyone can, uh, qualified can do the assessment of the value. And at that point, the pre-approval process is over and the application is submitted with knowledge of what you can afford and knowledge of what the home is worth. And this system worked for years relatively well <laughs> with uh, with a matter of days between the applicant's desire and those two being met. Can you comment on why we're not talking about the change to that system today? And Mr. Darrell, I'll start with you because you talked about refilling the backlog. I would propose that the worst thing in the world is to have more people into a system that takes six, nine months or more to get through while they have this period of uncertainty. Well, f first of all, the, the mortgage alternative program that Treasury has announced but yet not yet implemented is to, meant to deal with more upfront decisions about whether or not there is even a prospect that a trial modification makes sense and if not, you know, move to a short sell uh, type arrangement or other vehicle to help uh, create a smooth exit strategy. Yeah, but we're only talking about this program because if we right. continue doing what we've been doing that has failed, then only insanity if explains why we would continue doing what we know won't work. Well, I, I think in terms of making sure that the program has a fair opportunity, it needed to be set up to have some stability, to be managed properly. And I, I still think that if Treasury proceeds, uh, but there'll have to be better decisions made. Uh, the one key decision that <laughs> no, I... I'm going to cut yeah, you off. I'm going to yeah. cut you off because that's exactly 
business as usual around here. And I, I, I've gotten better from you many times. But in this case, Mr. Borofsky, I want to move to you because your, uh, your report told us we've, we've had enough time to see a trend. And people have suffered for a year under a program that isn't working and is unlikely to work dramatically better. Would you give us your comments on those changes or others that you want us to feature? Well, we're talking here about some of the structural problems with the servicers. I think that we're, we're, it's getting better. I mean, that's the good news. This, this whole idea of verbal modifications, and ver which I think is such a source of so many of the problems that right. you described. Right. We put in was, too much in the front end without hope of coming out the back end. In order end. to get these numbers up, to, to flood the, the system and, over, and the overcapacity, thankfully, that's going to be done. Uh, those have been, the Treasury has changed on that one. Um, and that, I think, will, in, will be very helpful to increase the conversion rate. Um, I think other of these structural issues, I think Treasury has got to decide and sort of do a final issue of guidance to foresee the various problems. And we're going to ask them that question in just a few minutes. So, so I think that there's good news that these structural things can be, be adjusted. I think the, the metrics, which are so important, as, as Mr. Dodaro recommended in July and we've reemphasized today, so you can have accountability and make changes to those benchmarks and those goals are important. But the third potential problem is redefault. Um, and that Treasury has not shown a willingness to reconsider or to reexamine. Yeah. Because ultimately, yeah. this, this program yeah. will yeah. not yeah. be successful. Thank if you. We're going to get to that. Out. The other two just wanted to chime in quickly, I believe, if the Chairman will yeah. indulge. Uh, thank you, Mr. Iza. I think your question is right on point. And I think, though, the answer is very much in your opening remarks when you mentioned that the Bank of America is about to do 45,000 principal write downs. Now, they were encouraged by state AGs. I will use the word encouraged loosely. But the point is, that is what's really going to make the difference at the end of the day, the principal write downs. And, you know, in defense of Treasury, I will say that on paper, the, the plan looks good. But the problem is, it's voluntary. And unless and until we have something like uh, what we proposed to Secretary Geithner and Secretary Paulson, uh, to Secretary Paulson in, in February of 08. You must have mandatory compliance in this program. You're not going to get the principal okay. right And dance. Dr. Capri, Capri yeah. you so that'll make, had the, that'll make the huge difference. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I now yield um, five minutes to uh, the gentleman from Maryland, Congressman Cummings. Thank you very much. Um, gentlemen, I'm very familiar with all of what you were saying because in my district we have uh, two people in my office that all they do is foreclosure prevention. That's all they do. And it's a big problem. And Mr. Borofsky, uh, what, if anything, prevents a lender from deciding midway through the HAMP process that the $1,000 or so whatever it might be incentive payment is not worth the company's resources and just say to heck with it? And, and the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do we get to this effectiveness and efficiency? Because it seems like we have a program here which we want to work we think should work, but when we scratch the surface, it's nothing, it's not, it's not working. So we've got the money, but we're not spending the money. And Mr. Cabrera, Calabria said it would cost us, it's costing us $400,000 a piece. That's not accurate because that means that if we were, that means that we spent all the money, but we aren't spending uh, we spend just a pittance of the money. So do we need a, a, some kind of different carrot? Do we di need some type of stick? I think that, you know, to answer your question about the, the, the midstream change of heart, um, I think it gets to a central point. Under the rules, um, a servicer, once they sign the contract and they, they, they run the net present value test and it's positive, they do have an obligation to go forward and modify the mortgage. Um, <laughs> but, but your question almost goes to one of compliance. How do we make sure that they follow those rules? Um, right now, Freddie Mac has been signed up to be the compliance agent. Uh, our office is about to, in, to do an audit, uh, about to announce an audit into compliance. I know the GAO is doing some work on compliance as well. Um, but that will be one of, one of the methods, which is a vigorous, and, and I think it's very important to have a compliance um, regimen in place. And one of the problems the GAO has pointed out, and I, I don't want to speak for them, is that it's taken a while just to, to get that compliance shop up and running. Uh, and we're going to see how effective it's been. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dodaro, um, other than your office and Mr. Barofsky's office, where is there, is there any other oversight of HAMP? And, and as we know, Freddie Mac is the 
compliance agent for HAMP? Has Freddie Mac met its responsibilities in, in that role? And what about within Treasury? Have sufficient resources been allocated to effectively administer and monitor the program? Uh, one of the recommendations we made uh, back uh, in July last year was that Treasury look at and make a determination whether it has the ac accurate enough resources uh, on board to uh, implement the program. We still think they need to be able to do that. In fact, they've uh, you know, went from uh, reduced the number of people that they've had on place from 36 to 29. They only have 27 to 29 positions filled. So we still think they need to look at whether or not they have enough people in order to be able to do it. Uh, we do think there needs to be a, an overall uh, compliance program put in place that's really not there that is, as uh, Mr. Borowski pointed out. We're going to continue to follow that up. But really, the, the oversight is really coming from our office and Mr. Borowski's office and needs to come from Treasury over the servicers. And that's why we've encouraged them to put a better system in place to ensure compliance. Now, Mr. Taylor, the, the NCRC has released the results of a survey of homeowners seeking assistance to avoid foreclosure. What were you looking for in the survey, and can you share some of your findings? And I understand that African American uh, folks were less likely to, to, to be able to benefit. They were less likely to benefit from the programs. And can you give us any, shed, us, shed any light on, on that for right. us? We were, we were trying to uh, uh, look at the, the front line of what was really transpiring for people. So we went to 29 counseling agencies around the country, not the entire country, but the folks we could work with. Is your mic on? Uh, okay. It looks like it's on. Okay, all right. How about now? Okay. And, it's uh, a close m closeness issue. You must be one with the mic. One with the mic. Okay. Um, can I get the uh, time back that I might have transferred? <laughs> okay. So uh, what we discovered that even to the minimal amount that the program's working, that if you're an African American, you're 50 percent less likely to get a modification under this program, which really is abhorring. And further, we also discovered that if you're 50 or older, and many people looking at heading towards retirement, many people who are indeed classified as seniors, 50% of them are going to uh, also have very, very, be get have great difficulty in getting a modification, a permanent modification. So, um, not only is the program really just not making the dent in the problem, it's not really being administered in a way that's fair across the board. I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen from um, Maryland. I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have said many times, I said in my opening statement, this thing is a mess. Um, Mr. Borofsky indicated in his opening comments that it's, it's tough to even have uh, to figure out what the exact goal is. You know, I learned a long time ago, you can't get anywhere if you don't know where you're going. You've got to have a defined goal you're trying to achieve. We've had changing metrics. We've had, you know, the promise or the hope of 4 million, potentially 4 million people getting their, their mortgage modified and yet 170,000 there. And then, of course, the redefault problem that's already been, uh, been talked about. For those who actually get permanent, 40 percent of them are likely to redefault. So uh, a total mess. But I actually want to go to Mr. In Calabria. Am I saying it right? We've heard several. Calabria, okay. I've heard several fronts. You, you, you said, I think, great, you know, it, it's tough to pay a mortgage if you don't have a job. I mean, that's, that's what this in large part boils down to. So we can have, we can continue to have this big government-oriented approach, uh, big spending, big regulation to, to our economic concerns out there, or frankly, in my humble opinion, we, we can get back to creating a framework and an environment that actually is conducive to economic growth, actually fosters job creation in the private sector, and, um, and I would argue uh, doesn't create policies that, that, that don't create uncertainty out there for the small business owner and, and the people who actually create jobs. So uh, my, my question is a general one to you. Um, what is Congress doing right in, in fostering a framework and a context for economic growth and job creation to take place in the private sector? Uh, what, in fact, is Congress? I, I mean, I think that we've got a lot of things we're doing wrong. Um, uh, but a general question on what we can do to, to get to the heart of this. Because, again, until you have a job, it's tough to make a mortgage payment. 
Uh, and I would agree, and I, and I would emphasize, and I, and I would say as well, to touch on the last question, uh, we've certainly seen during this recession that uh, African Americans have been hit harder in terms sure of the have. labor market than anybody else. And certainly, this is part of the reason that this explains why the denial rates are different, because quite frankly, the HAMP program does not really help you if you've lost your job. And it, it does not deal with that as an issue. So I think this needs to be rethought in that regard. Uh, I would say as a broad uh, measure, private sector needs to have some certainty to be able to plan. So despite whatever one might think about any set of rules or legislation, you need to have a set of rules so that the uh, private sector can plan around them. Uh, and I think many businessmen would probably tell you that even a bad set of rules that they know that they can plan with is better than rules that change, you know, off and on. So, uh, you know, my own perspective, so w w whether, whatever one thinks about uh, the recently passed health care, at least it's done. Yeah. And that's something that the private sector can move forward with and plan around. Uh, I do think we need to get our situation in terms of, you know, our fiscal situation in order. I, any small businessman today is going to, is, has to factor higher taxes into his future plans. Yeah. And no, no, that's no, something that I think we need a credible path going forward on. Uh, I think we also need to find ways to get banks to lend again in a serious way. And this is, I think, one of the perverse uh, implications of where monetary policy and fiscal policy have worked against us. Normally, very low record interest rates help create uh, businesses. But in this environment, banks are essentially able to borrow at nothing put it in treasury bills for three, three and a half percent. Good, good That's an, a very large interest rate margin for a bank risk free. If they're doing that, they have no incentive to go out and lend to the private sector because they can really just make great risk free returns right now. Part of that is they're trying to make these returns to cover up the losses they have on their balance sheets. Right. I think we need to be more aggressive in terms of the bank regulators and making banks actually recognize losses on their balance sheets. Uh, we've got at least probably half a tree and then probably let second lien loans that aren't recognized. Do you, do you think we'd be better off simply not having the program? you think that the false hope this program gives to some homeowners, the problems we've seen, the, the, the uh, lack of transparency, the lack of a clearly defined goal, everything we've seen over the last year, uh, you think we'd be better off uh, I, I, simply I think letting the market work and, and letting, as, as, as the, the ranking member pointed out in his opening statement, letting banks work with their, uh, the, the homeowner the servicer work with the homeowner and or the bank, the lending institutes work with the homeowner and work it out amongst themselves versus the heavy hand of government coming in. Well, I, I would say as an overall short answer of that is given how few people have actually been helped relative to the universe of it, I think it's probably done more harm than good and that you have encouraged people to, for instance, a lot of what I hear is sometimes people were encouraged to, in order to get to the front of the line, stop paying your mortgage. Well, yeah, that's going to ding your credit. Uh, so I think some of this, you're really encouraging probably more harm than good. I will lay out, you know, my bias and, and my I, I, perspective I, is that I think taking Mr. our Taylor's adjustment in the housing in here, market. But I, I did want to, well, I'll go to Mr. Taylor. I will, I will yield the gentleman an additional minute. You're, oh, God you're throwing you, the Chair. baby out with the bathwater here. I mean, look, it's, it's, to say that it's done more harm than good is just ludicrous. It, it, simply, oh, hasn't, disagree with it's, it simply hasn't been effective. And also, to start from the premise that, you know, well, the problem is unemployment and, and, and lack of equity, as he puts it. That's why we're having these foreclosures. It's kind of like saying, well, the house is gone. Why is the house gone? Well, it burned down. And then stopping with that level of thinking. Why did it burn down? We have unemployment and lack of equity because of a massive foreclosure, malfeasant uh, lending practices that put people in unsustainable look, mortgages. Look, look. And, and, and to reverse that, we've got to address that, first clean it up, but also understand that well, you you, 8 question. million American families are not wrong, Congressman. Yeah. 8 million American families didn't set out to put themselves in a malfeasant loan or an unsustainable loan. I'm just saying, well, it certainly sounds like you're saying that. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just and saying that a program that is, is, lacks the accountability that this one does and, and extends false hope to people we're, the very people we're trying to help is a program that has serious uh, flaws and, and, and failures. And what we so want to correct. The program let me work. ask. Let me. I want to do one last question, if I can, in my last minute, my extra minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to to the Inspector General. Um, wh why do you think Treasury is reluctant to? One, one of the suggestions you had in your report, and I asked this, I think, to Mr. Allison in the last hearing we had, reluctant to look at the underlying loan to determine if some of the fraudulent things were there in the in the original loan. Why why is Treasury reluctant to implement that suggestion you had in your last report? Um, as they've explained it to me, is that it's it's sort of a 
akin to a, uh, a resource issue from their perspective. They believe that tracking the original loan, this, again, this is the explanation that they provided, um, that getting the original loan file and the original loan application would be very resource intensive. As you know, these mortgages go, are sold, were sold and resold and resold and resold, uh, and therefore um, they claim that it would be very difficult to obtain the original mortgage file. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield to the I now yield to Congressman Lynch from Massachusetts. So he's nope, not, not here. I now yield from, to Mrs. Norton of D.C. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was uh, uh, daunted and amazed by Mr. Calabria's notion in the middle of a crisis, better to have no program than to take a program where we are essentially dealing with an not only unanticipated but unprecedented crisis and everybody knows we're learning as we go along because we've never done it before uh, and so the notion of saying well so leave everybody out there as my my friend on the other if side I could, to negotiate for themselves uh you know uh, it, it has blown my mind i have a question here about the second lien program because these are the people the general, yield? the general lady will not yield she has only a few minutes you had your time. Uh, the, um, I, I'm particularly concerned about those at very particular ri risk and a program that uh, may meet Mr. Calabria's notion of better not have it than have it because it hasn't done anything, although I do not buy his notion that you should just leave people out there on their own uh, when even government can't figure out what to do. Um, this notion about 50 percent of the, we know that 50 percent of the homes in foreclosure had a second lien on them. So now you really have trouble here. A year ago, Treasury announced, okay, we understand it in their learning curve, and they uh, instituted a new component of HAMP to help home, home, homeowners with multiple liens on their property. Now, these figures uh, need to be explained. Only three servicers have signed up. What kept that from happening? Uh, no second liens have been modified. Uh, that's a year into the program. So I, that's beyond failure, uh, beyond needing fixing. It may need to be <laughs> totally rethought. Although I do not buy into the notion that, all right, throw up your hands and don't do anything. I want to ask Mr. Uh, Borofsky, Mr. Uh, uh, Dodaro, and Mr. Taylor in particular, first to get at the root cause. Why didn't this program get off the ground in the first place as a component of HAMP? Uh, and without such a program, is there any way to help these people who have second liens and may be in the greatest need of all? Mr. Borofsky, why don't we start with you and go to the three gentlemen I asked? Sure. Um, well, I think that it is good news that in the last week they've signed up two of you know two additional. Um, what happened in the last week that they somebody got religion there? Well, we did provide a draft audit of our report uh, about two weeks ago. So, um, although I, I think that's something that's been in the works, but but your frustration, we share your frustration as as we we detail in our report. Um, you know, in the original draft it was just one, and we're, we're it's good to see that they've signed up three of the biggest players in the market. Um, but it has been a year um, since the, the details of this, of this, the idea of modifying second loans, and it is such an important part of this program. So is the lack of people signing up that kept it from getting off the ground? Was more needed to make that happen? Uh, perhaps. I mean, we have not yet audited the second lien program. It's something we wanted to see, let it get off the ground before we did so, but that's, those are very good questions that need to be answered. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dodaro? Uh, uh, first of all, uh, Treasury had not uh, established yet a date for when they were going to start the program, and a lot of the program details aren't, aren't very clear yet. So it goes to the question of, of After a year, they aren't very clear? Well, that's, that was our, uh, that's the status of, of it, and that's why we think uh, you know, the program hasn't got off and running. And it goes also to Congressman Ice's question. I mean, really, the second lien program, I think, needs to be established in addition to what they're doing as well as doing.